ways for you to work. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mark, for, for recording. I don't need that reminder at the bottom of the screen anymore. Um, so like I said, Terry has shared the link to these slides. Uh, there'll be a few interactive items for you as we progress. Um, my name's Brian. Uh, I'll be one of your facilitators for this week. Um, this is the uh, title slide. So hopefully this looks like the thing that you signed up for. Um, we are going to uh, probably do more talking this morning than we're going to typically do uh, throughout the week, uh, just because we need to give everybody an orientation and make sure we communicate our expectations. Um, first, let's have our primary facilitators uh, introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Brian. I'm a physics instructor at the University of North Florida. I've been integrating computation into my classes for uh, several years now, um, officially for about five or six years, probably. Um, Terry, would you like to introduce yourself next? Sure. Thanks, Brian. Um, my name is Terry Galanti. I'm also an ass assistant professor at University of North Florida. I sit in the College of Education, so I focus on integrating computational thinking in K through 12 classrooms. So I work with prospective mathematics teachers and also K through 12 teachers who are learning about computer science. And Mark, go ahead and introduce yourself. Mark is unmuted. Wonder if he's having mic trouble. He's stand, He's sitting very still. Which <laughs> oh, I've got I've got a blank screen for him. So okay, Mark, whenever. Frozen. He needs okay. to reboot or something. Okay, actually his window just disappeared. Fortunately, he made me co-host, so we should be all right. Okay, well, Mark's been your primary point of contact. Uh, chances are you've you've gotten to message back and forth with him. Whenever he gets back on, we will have him introduce himself. Um, we would love to get to know all of you. Uh, if we did the whole round robin, everybody introduce themselves, uh, we would be here all morning with introductions. So we're going to have you introduce yourselves in your breakout rooms in about half an hour. We also have a number of um, facilitators um, who are uh, graciously helping us out in your breakout rooms. We'll have them introduce themselves uh, once they uh, join the breakout rooms as well. Um, a reminder to our facilitators, if you haven't done so, please right click on your uh, face and click rename to add facilitator after your name so that people know they can go to you with questions. Mark, are you back? Uh, how's that? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, no idea what I did. Um, so welcome everyone. It's great to see everyone here, and I'm so excited that there's so such a big interest in this topic. Uh, this is one that's really important to me, and I'm I'm glad to see so many people from so many different places that are excited about it, or at least as excited as I am about it. Um, I am the K-12 program manager at the American Association of Physics Teachers, uh, but I also teach high school physics in uh, just outside Washington D.C. in Northern Virginia. Uh, I teach AP Physics, and um, uh, I have been in incorporating uh, computation into my courses for the last uh, three or four years now. And um, I'm pretty excited to to share all these resources with everyone. Awesome. Um, so again, we're glad so many people are interested. We're also excited that so many people have expressed regrets that they could not join us this week. So uh, we will very likely be getting a second iteration of this in the works, I'm guessing. Uh, so we may be contacting uh, all of you to uh, help us out as facilitators if we do this again, because you will be the experts at that point. Um, okay, so now that we've introduced ourselves, we're gonna talk a little bit about pedagogical motivation for using computation. We'll talk about some of the pragmatic motivation in terms of the uh, skills that we want to develop in our students. And then we're going to spend the bulk of our time this morning on an introductory activity for you. Um, this is where you're going to go into your breakout groups. And we want you for this morning to pretend you are a student. We're not really looking for you to learn all the computational stuff you need today. Uh, in fact, we're really not expecting you to learn any computational stuff today. We want you to go through an activity and really reflect on what it would be like for your students to participate in an activity like this one, not necessarily this one. Maybe this one fits into your class. Maybe it doesn't. But we just want you to kind of get the experience of it from a learner's perspective 
so that when we start going through more systematically tomorrow, you have an idea of what it is you're looking for. Um, we'll also address the question, I'm sure that's going to come up uh, for many of you, how do I make time for this in my class? And we'll talk a little bit about how we uh, scaffold computational learning. Okay, so I want to open the floor for a little discussion. Feel free to unmute your microphone or type out an answer in the chat, whichever you're comfortable with. Um, I want you to review the problem and the student solution here on the right side of the screen. And I want you to answer two questions. What do you notice about this student solution to the problem? And then maybe a more provocative question, where in the student solution is the student doing physics? I think when the when the student decides to apply the kinematics equations to the problem, they're doing physics. Okay, so they're making a decision. Tell me a little more about that. Um, well, they're they're reading the prompt and they're saying, okay, what are the equations of of motion for something, you know, projectile motion, you know, new area resistance? They're kind of making all those decisions. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. So they've got to decide what equations to use, right? That's certainly not told them in the problem. Awesome. They're also going through and finding the information that they need the, from the, the problem and breaking it down into horizontal and, and vertical motion. So understanding the, the independence of those two directions and which data is applicable to horizontal motion and which data is applicable to vertical motion. Okay, again, there's some decision-making involved, right? Uh, Jeff, it sounds like you're talking about the model that they're applying, right? That, okay, I can separate this into horizontal and vertical dimensions. That certainly, uh, you know, that's certainly not given in the problem. That's something they have to learn to adopt. What else? One comment on that is, Yes, all of those things are doing physics. So choosing to model this as something with a constant acceleration downward in the y direction and no acceleration in the x direction, that is a decision. But many students are not aware that that is a decision because if all they see are constant acceleration projectile motion problems, they just think, oh, these are the equations of motion for kinematics. Uh, you know, kinematics problem. I write down one half AT squared and they don't realize there are other things it could be as well. It's just not here. Yeah, that's a great point, Walter. Um, and you're 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 taking the bait of why I chose this problem. You know, yes, the students making decisions. My question would be, what other choices could they have made when it comes time to solve this problem? Maybe well, that's worth discussing. What's What's interesting is I would actually argue that much past the third line, where they labeled some stuff, they're actually not doing physics; they're doing math. Because what they've totally missed is that these are vectors. Uh, you don't even have to split them out into component systems. You merely need to draw the vectors. And then you just have trig of a right triangle to solve for your distance. Um, and so really, in truth, what we've got here is just a, a math problem that you would typically see in uh, pre-calculus. Uh, they actually haven't really done physics because there's no vector notation. There's no diagram. Uh, there's no understanding that, uh, you know, which direction gravity is going in. All right. So that's a good point, George. There's a, there is a choice of representation here, right? They have chosen to represent this as I have a pair of equations that I got from the textbook. And if I I've been trained that if I plug in the right numbers, I will get the right answer. Uh, Marcy says something similar in the chat to me. They are just doing math. They aren't acknowledging the model or sketching what's happening. And Jeremy says, I don't think we really have much evidence of what physics they have or haven't done, right? So think of this in terms of your assessment, right? We can argue all day about, you know, what, to what degree they're doing physics. But if I'm using this as an assessment, what am I assessing? Am I assessing their physics knowledge? Am I assessing their mathematical prowess? 
uh, Philip agrees there in chat. Um, Y'all have definitely taken the bait on my provocative question there. Um, I come with a very, I come up with a very similar answer there. When I reflected on this problem, um, I think about, well, when they acknowledge that the acceleration is only in the vertical direction. So they're, they're, they're thinking a little bit in terms of direction. They haven't explicitly communicated that. Uh, and when they think about what those components are, they are they are thinking about the physical system. But I agree with with uh, with the bulk of the answers we've seen. You know, the rest of this is really a math problem. They could do this in their pre-calculus class. It's just we're giving them a context for it. Now, that's not a bad thing. It's a great thing to give them an application of the math that they're learning because they don't always get that in their math classes. But I think we can all agree it would be nice to engage the students in more diverse modes of activity, right? If this is the only type of physics problem they ever see is this maybe plus forces, maybe plus circuits or something. But if it's the same type of rhythm every time, eh, it would be nice to engage them a little more. Um, also, Walter talked about, uh, you know, what if it's not a constant acceleration motion? What if there's, uh, heaven forbid, a, a an air resistance force in this? So it would be nice to explore more real world problems there. And it would also be nice to reduce some of these mathematical barriers, right? So if I'm assessing the student's physics understanding with this problem, then really my physics assessment is contingent on how well they did in that algebra two or that pre-calculus class. Now, we've all been raised up and trained that math is the language of physics, and it certainly is in a lot of ways. But what if I want to assess the student's understanding of the physics independent of their mathematical capabilities? I would certainly like to be able to do that too. Let me show you another way we might solve this problem. So now tell me about this solution here. Um, we've got a little bit of Python over here on the right, but hopefully it looks uh, moderately familiar in terms of the math setup. Um, what do you notice about this student's solution and where are they doing physics here in this solution? Oh, okay. So it, it kind of looks like they're doing their physics uh, right about lines 9 and 10. They've got the kinematics equations. They've labeled them X and Y. Uh, and they understand that they're going to have to iterate through time. Uh, so it's almost kind of a beginner Euler's method. Um, they set up a, a, a delta T of 0 0.1 seconds. Um, so yeah, I'd say probably about lines one and lines nine and ten, they've done their physics. After that, it's simply just letting the computer crank through on the math. Cool, George. So you used uh, a couple of vocabulary words that you said iterate and Euler method. Could you take a second to define those for us? Sure. So uh, on the iterate, you're looking at the while y is greater than zero, uh, so that you're going through a process of looping. Each time you're looping, you're incrementing your time by uh, 0 0.1 seconds. You're going to keep going until uh, you're actually going to keep going until your y value is just below zero. Uh, you'll probably get a negative number, um, relatively small. Uh, Euler's method is a method of doing an approximation uh, by taking smaller and smaller increments of delta time and just assuming that you're going in a uh, for best case scenario, I guess like a linear method, a linear process in between. Cool. Yeah, so question. that's exactly what we've done here. Uh, for those unfamiliar, um, you can read this code cell pretty much like a math equations. You read it to, from the top to the bottom. The computer is going to execute it in order. Uh, the only couple of technical things on here, George already described this process of iterating uh, lines 12 through 15, is what we call a loop. The computer is going to repeat those lines until y is no longer greater than zero, right? So the student is reasoning, well, if I'm waiting for the pool ball to hit the ground, I need to keep running the, the, the math here until I get to a y of zero. 
So y equal to zero or probably y slightly less than zero is going to trigger this thing to stop. And so it's just going to keep calculating the x and y at each of those times. And so this is actually getting the student more information than the algebraic solution, because the algebraic solution, we're just doing this once. Here, if we're having the computer do it at steady increments of time, uh, we're getting a lot of that information. Now, of course, I've only had it print the final information. Um, Terry actually made a better version of this than mine because she always improves my codes. Um, if you click on this link here, this student solution, you'll see your very first sample Python code for today. Uh, let me see if I can turn off my dark mode here. Some people don't prefer that. Oh no, I've got the hard mode, the dark mode hardwired on the, this new tablet. I'll have to figure out a way to turn that off before I screen share again. Um, so this is an improved version that Terry made. Terry added an additional print statement here that's actually going to create a table down here. So uh, this is what we call a Jupyter notebook. This is the system you're going to be working in throughout the week. Um, a Jupyter notebook has two types of cells. There is a code, excuse me, there are text cells and there are code cells. Okay, uh, let me get back to Walter and just a, Walter's comment there in just a second. Um, there are two types of cells. There are text cells and there are code cells. And the beautiful thing about um, these two different types of cells is that one does the computational work for you. The code cell is just like you would expect in kind of a traditional programming environment. But then the text cell allows you to add notes. So like if I double click in here, I can add more documentation. So for example, I could add uh, some math expressions here. So I could say, you know, I could have my X initial equals zero comma Y initial equals 0 0.6. Uh, for those unfamiliar, this is using LaTeX formatting. Um, you can go and Google LaTeX stuff if you want, um, but uh, we'll, 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 we'll get into that as we need to throughout the week. Um, but then down here, we've got um, so the code cell. The goal of the code cell is to run the Python code for us. So if you click the play button here, uh, it's going to tell you this notebook was not authored by Google. I promise that it will work out just fine for you. And then down here, what it's doing, you can actually see the loop here because it's actually putting out these numbers every time it goes through the loop. So you can see what it's doing at each of those steps. And just like George uh, referenced, it's going to keep going as long as that Y is positive. And then on the last go round, it gets a negative Y and that triggers, okay, I need to stop because the Y greater than zero is no longer true. And so that's why we can have the pull ball land at T equals 0 0.4 and X equals 0 0.96. Now, of course, we're off by a little bit, right? We're off by a little bit because we're technically going a little bit below the ground. So first question for reflection, if I wanted to make this result better, if I wanted to get closer to a Y of zero, what do y'all think we could change about this to make it a little bit more accurate? The smaller DT. Okay, so if the DT is the time step, if it's the amount of time in between each spot on this animation, this is the thing that controls the accuracy. So let's watch what happens if we put another zero in there. What's the first thing you notice is different about our output here? We get a lot more data, right? Because if you're taking smaller steps, you're gonna end up taking more steps, right? So we've gone from a few blocky steps to a to more finer grain steps. So that's gonna give us more of these. And you notice we actually land right on 0.0, .0 right? So again, thinking in terms of significant digits, there's probably more rounding going on out here. So we might be missing something here, but this is giving us a, a slightly more accurate answer than we, than we wanted. Yes, we have to pay the computer more as Walter's saying in chat. That's a, that's, that's a wonderful analogy there. So I want to talk for a second. Tell me, how could you use this method to engage more students in more diverse, more diverse modes of activity beyond just that algebraic solution we had before? Or how do you think you could use this to maybe apply a more real world problem? Or how do you think you could use this to maybe reduce some of those mathematical barriers we often encounter with students? 
I think this one has a simpler physical interpretation because you're just tracking the trajectory. You're right. not manipulating equations for a long time. You just really look at the ball, where is it? Yeah, and you're actually getting some trajectory data out because now if I get all of this data, if I get out this X and this Y, what else could I do with this data now? You can plot it. I could actually plot this. And now instead of going to the graphing calculator and saying, okay, here are the magic equations I have been handed, I can actually take this data, examine it, do something with it, treat it like it's an experiment, right? What else? What else do y'all think? Well, well, the big one is that you can seamlessly move on to things that you couldn't do algebraically. That's like, I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, this is very cool. Right? Nowhere in here, well, technically here we are getting an exact solution, right? So in, in this case, what we're doing is we're taking our analytical solution and we're taking that one step at a time. So I, I did bring in an analytical solution here. But on Thursday, you're going to learn about... Uh, uh, um, George referenced the Euler method. We're going to learn about how the Euler method doesn't care whether you have an analytical solution. All I need for the Euler method is distance equals velocity times time and change in velocity equals force over mass times the time step. If I just take those two and keep repeating those, it doesn't matter whether my problem has an analytical solution. I can put in air resistance. I can put in a, a, a variable altitude gravity. I can put in all that stuff we have to sort of sweep under the rug for our students because they haven't had a course in partial differential equations. I mean, why would they? We're, we're talking high school context, right? Ah, Kelly says you can also compare the algebraic solution to the code and say, look, you can solve this in different ways and get the same thing. Yes, what this really does is open the door for saying, look, if you have a problem in physics, you can approach it from multiple different ways and show that you'll end up at a consistent answer. I think you can also, like, I in my high school class, I do address... Um, two very simple partial differential, or I mean, sorry, not partial differential equations, but ordinary differential equations. Mm -hmm. Like if they watch the computer do the calculation, it means that they understand where the differential equation comes from. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, ultimately what we're getting at is the fact that Newton's second law, right? The, the, the core thing in that first half of a high school physics class, it's written as a differential equation. And so we, we, we try to make it accessible and we try to pick problems that we can solve algebraically. And we do a good job of picking those problems and of making them as accessible and as applicable as possible. But if we could open that door just a little wider, if we could use the computation to kind of sneak around the calculus, then suddenly we've got way more problems we can solve. We've got a lot more we can, and suddenly this becomes rather than solving the problem to get the answer, this becomes exploring the problem to see what it might do. Uh, Mark also says, our, uh, also ask students to find the time step required to get a numerical solution that is accurate uh, uh, to an error to the exact solution given by the kinematic equations. Right, so now we're talking about what does it mean when we talk about error? What does it mean when we talk about accuracy? And now we're talking about those concepts, not just in the lab setting, right? Now we're talking about them on the modeling side, as well as on the experimental side. Okay, awesome. Sounds like we've got some good insights into this. So I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what people do with their activity today. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the pedagogical motivation for adopting computation. There's also a pragmatic motivation. Um, and this is the slide, if you need something to take back to your principals or your parents to further motivate this, this is the slide I would show them. It's the computational activities allows us to help prepare students with career relevant skills. Um, when American Institute of Physics surveys uh, recent physics bachelors going into any STEM field, not just physics, but any engineering, computer science, et cetera, uh, programming always comes up uh, very highly rated. So this, so in, in this, question students were asked, or not students, excuse me, uh, alumni were asked, what type of activities do you use most often in your job as a STEM person? And programming always comes up at about 75% uh, saying at least monthly 
if not weekly or daily, that they use programming, right? And that's the challenge we've taken on in the undergraduate world, because we've been looking at this data and saying, wait a minute, we need to train our students to do some programming in a STEM context. Uh, but then also you look down here, simulation or modeling and tech support, those also get rated highly. And so these are practical skills our students can use regardless of what programming language they end up uh, working in. And then the other reason to do this is that we're providing a more authentic demonstration of STEM careers. I can't tell you the number of times uh, I have to spend a couple of weeks at the beginning of the semester convincing students that, yes, coding programming is part of what we do in physics. Like, like you signed up for a physics class. You did sign up for a thing where we're working with a computer. So many of them have this model of physics where it's half experiment, half theory. And then crazy Dr. Lane has me do some programming, but I don't know why. But really what we're doing is providing with that authentic experience of what a STEM career is like. Okay, so the thing Probably about half of you are thinking the question we get all the time at uh, at conferences at workshops is how do I make the time for this because this sounds great. This sounds like a great way to engage my students, but how do I actually make the time for this. Well, I would turn the question around, how do you make time for labs. Well, you make time for labs because that's how you deliver the instruction and so we're not talking about integrating computation as another topic. Instead, we're talking about integration as, excuse me, talking about computation as integrating another method for how you deliver the topic. So think about when you teach projectile motion, you probably have the students solve some problems like we saw earlier, and you probably have them do an experiment alongside it to see if the problem solving method worked. Well, now we're talking about saying, okay, we're going to teach projectile motion by having them do those two things and by doing a computer model. And so we're not talking about carving time out from topics. We're talking about carving time out from having another problem solving session or doing another experiment. We're saying, okay, we're going to spend this afternoon working with a computational model. And so when I'm designing my physics courses, the way I think through it is which methods are going to best serve each topic. So for example, projectile motion, I can check all three boxes. I can do uh, a computational activity, an experimental activity, and a problem solving activity. Same thing with springs. I love doing springs this way because you can get this nice consistent solution across all three methods. But when I teach planetary orbits, I'm not doing an experiment with that, right? I can't really do an experiment with that. I, mean, I can show them an animation of planets going around, but I, I can't really do an experiment with that. So there, I'm going to focus on a computational model and doing some problem solving. But when I talk about diffraction, we can do a couple problems. They're not that exciting. Instead, I'm going to send them to the experiment, and I'm going to send them to a computational model so that we can really compare those two together rather than solving a relatively simplistic equation. So Another way we think about this when we're integrating computation is think about how we are scaffolding the computational learning process, because a lot of students and a lot of teachers will get intimidated by this notion of how am I going to get my students to write this code? The answer is you don't. Um, so we instead typically go the other way. We start very basic by thinking in terms of, I want my students to be able to read code. So we would do an activity just like we did a few slides ago where I presented that code to you. We would just have the code in front of the students and say, read this, tell me what you think it does. Then we talk about with them about using code. So we talk about, okay, here is the code for this projectile motion. Can you tweak a couple of numbers? Can you tweak the acceleration due to gravity and tell me how that's going to change the trajectory? Can you tweak the, the launch angle or the initial speed of the projectile? Then we talk about modifying code. Okay, here is our projectile motion code. It's giving us the amount of time it takes to land. Can you now add a command to make a graph of that trajectory? Can you now add some commands to calculate the kinetic energy and the potential energy? And then finally, at the end of the course, at the end of the school year, that's when we say, okay, here's a project, go and make some code that can solve this problem, right? It's really only at the end that we ever take those training wheels off. 
Um, the technical term for this that we're talking about is a minimally working program. Um, this is where you provide an incomplete code to start an activity. It runs, it doesn't produce any errors, it accomplishes some minor tasks, but it doesn't do everything that you want. Um, so the students interact with NWPs usually in groups. They usually are working together on it. That way each student only needs to understand a fraction of what's going on. Um, an analogy you might think of is if your students come into lab and you've already got the equipment set up for them, you're not taking the data for them, you're not using the equipment for them, but you do have it set up to kind of get past that initial hurdle. And that's the equivalent of an MWP. Um, MWPs help you shift the focus from the syntax of what does this line do and how do I set up this, uh, this operation here? To the actual physics, the actual sense making, and if you if you skip that step of writing the code from scratch, you get to the physics sooner. Um, another thing to think about as you're thinking about integrating computation is what you want to grade. Are you really interested in grading the code? Do you just want to grade the results and we're not going to worry about how the student set up the code? Or do you want to grade some sort of write-up at the end, like a lab report? There's really no wrong answer. Myself, I never grade code itself. I am really interested in the results the students get and the write-up that they make, but the order in which they do things or how efficient their code is, I almost never grade because it's not part of my learning objectives. Somebody else may have different learning objectives. Somebody else may say, nope, I've got to teach them how to write clean, efficient code, and that's what I'm going to grade. Okay, good for you. You'll have to offload some content somewhere, but you can definitely do that. Uh, Walter says, NWPs also help reinforce the idea that which computer language you use isn't that important, since usually the part you write for the students is the language-specific details. The physics algorithm that they write is usually very similar between all languages. Abs a a amen, Walter. Yes, so, so part of the goal here is for the students to see where the physics is in the code, and, and, and the rest is really set dressing. Like, I almost never worry about how my students are setting up the graph. I will just give them the code and say, okay, here's how you make a graph out of this. What I want you to do, student, is go in and play around with a physical model because that's the thing that I'm interested in. Okay, so let's talk for a couple minutes about getting you started with today's activity. Um, you're going to access today's Jupyter Notebook in DeepNote. Um, here are some instructions for creating an account if you have not done so already. We've also got a link where you can join our deep note team. I'm going to keep an eye out on my email for those join requests so that I can approve those. And remember, the goal for this morning's uh, uh, activity is to work through an example, not to learn the ins and outs of the coding. What we're going to want you to do is go to this link to find the first activity falling through the earth. Um, Terry has some instructions for you to duplicate this code because we don't want you changing our original, but we do want you to duplicate it. Um, so Terry, I think you're going to share your screen to walk people through that duplication process. Oh, Terry, you are muted. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Multitasking. Um, so, Brian, go ahead and share your screen again and maybe go to the next slide very quickly in case um, folks are not following along in Google with us. So if you can go to slide 10, um, because we were having a conversation yesterday because everything related to computers is changing in the moment. Right. And if you look at the blue box on the right left hand side, on the right side of your screen, you'll see that you can duplicate individual files using that side of your, your deep note screen. What I personally like to do is to duplicate projects instead of individual oh, files and share my screen to talk about how I do that. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop your sharing, Brian. This is annoying. All right, so hopefully you are seeing deep note here, um, get back to the top. So notice that we are on morning one. So what I'm gonna do is go to the left-hand side of my screen where you see the workspace. Under the tab that says teacher materials, yours might not be open. So if you go ahead and open that tab, under morning one, you'll see that there are three ellipses next to that. So if I click on those ellipses, one of my options is to duplicate the project. And when I do that, you'll notice that opt-in is the folder that's housing all of our workshop materials. But I also have a folder with my name on it. 
So what I choose to do in the way that I worked on the programs that so I could look at them before our workshop was to create a copy in my own folder. Now I'm not going to duplicate that now because that will replace all the edits that I made to my files over the past couple of weeks. But you'll notice that you should have two options to either just your name or private next to it. And we encourage you to just do your name because that way we can go in and take a look if you have questions and see your code as well. Um, and I think I'm watching the chat as well. Let's maybe take Brian a five, 10 minute break here and give people a chance to maybe duplicate that file and ask questions before sure. we go ahead. That sounds great. Okay. And I'll go ahead and stop sharing at this point. And Brian, do you see Jeremy has something in the note about needing permission? Are you, it might be. Uh, let me go look. Okay. Let me, yeah. If you want to request permission, those will come up on my notifications. I, I thought we had added everybody, but we will, uh, we will get the last of you put in there. I'm totally lost folks. I didn't know about deep note. So I tried to sign up, but I don't know how it's working. Sure. So it's usually tied, you can usually tie it to a Google account, like when you go to the sign up. Yeah, page. that's what yeah. I did. I, I'm going to, I'm going to share my screen. If yeah, I go can. for it. Yeah. Uh, so here, if you can, do, if you can walk them through that, I'm going to go approve all of these uh, join requests. Yeah. And I'm also going to copy the link that takes us directly to our deep notes in from slide number nine i'm going to throw that in the chat as well actually actually hold off on that cherry there is a i forgot there is a join link we can just send okay uh, member invite link copy okay so here is, is this one that i just pasted in chat i think so yes yep. and i paste it as well because why not <laughs> and i'm just going to throw something in here that we have created a very flexible workshop. So we will yeah. take whatever time we need. Our goal is for you to feel comfortable with the tools that we're sharing and the approaches you can use in your classroom. So don't ever feel like you're, you're slowing anything down if you're asking questions. Yeah. Yeah. The entire point of the first day is to make sure we've got everything we need set up. I have no trouble getting into the workspace, but when I try to click on the specific thing linked on page nine, uh, the falling through the earth is when I can't access okay. it. Maybe I can't share a link like that, like I thought I could. So let me go in and get the, let me see if there's an actual share link. We are learning deep note as well. We recently switched over from Google Colab because we thought the copying process was straightforward. All right, public sharing is disabled. Well, why would you do that? Okay, this is morning one sample activity. Okay, so once you're joined, once you're joined, click on there. Try that one. And Brian, I just want to point out that uh, it seems that some uh, of us are mistakenly duplicating the, the file and not the workspace. That's OK. That's, I that's fine. Sure. I, as, as long as you've got your own copy to work with, just you can you can click on the little context menu to rename. Um, add your name to it. That way, nobody else will will mess with it. That's I we we can clean it up later. Okay. I do see people are on, so something some process is working. I just didn't want anyone to be confused if they see two of the uh, yeah yeah the first activity. Let's let's say let's say no editing until we get to the breakout rooms. How about that? And I'm reading a couple comments in the chat that I'm I'm not exactly sure what's happening. So if you're if you're having trouble, feel free to share your screen and then we can try to troubleshoot yeah. that way as well. Hi, can I share my screen? Please. <laughs> okay. Uh, Terry, we can also, if we need to, if we've got uh, the bulk of people ready to go, we could just make a breakout room for Getting, getting folks finished setting I up. I like that idea that one of us can just stay and, and do some of that troubleshooting while folks get started mm -hmm. on the activity. But yeah, perfect. Yeah, there you are, Kelly. So right under there where it's got, oh, your layout a little bit different than mine. Yeah, so I, I copied yeah. it over into mine, but then like- Perfect. Nothing's there. Hmm. Like if I click on them, nothing happens. Yeah. <laughs> Bizarre. 
But here, let me, uh, Kelly, do you mind? Oh, I don't have the ability to request remote control. Okay, never mind. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Why don't you go to. When you see the full workbook in the original, like you've, you've cloned it from opt in, right? Can you see it in opt in? Um, mm. No. Okay, you might try a different browser, would be my okay. suggestion. Let's try a different browser. I haven't tried it outside of Chrome, so. I can confirm it works in Firefox on Linux. Okay. And it's working in Firefox for me too. Uh, it does also work in Edge, which is what I'm in. I missed the instructions for copying because I was trying to sign up for Deep Note. In it's okay. The so what what am I supposed to do? On the uh, on the. So when, when, when Terry and I view it, we just saw Kelly had a different view. So feel free to tell us if your view is different. Um, on the left side of the screen, there should be a list of projects. Um, it says like workspace and morning one, morning two, perfect. morning three. Yeah. Actually, Janice, do you want to share your screen? We don't have anybody sharing right now. I'm just about to. Share. Cool. So yeah. So Mark, if you want to demonstrate, he's going to click on the uh, the three dots right next to yep. sample activity. There is duplicate project. That's the easiest way to do it. Well, All right. That's think, the way that was easy for us. And then just and and then just call it. I would I would put it in opt in private, and then that is your uh, or just opt. Actually, now I forget what we said. Uh, yeah, I think Mark, if you go back, like, see how it says Mark Hannum, that is your personal folder. Yeah, so we yeah, were suggesting yeah. people put it in a public personal. Yeah, you there can you always share it with us later if you need to. All right, let me try this. Got to flip all these screens. We should have a different, a different one. Go on for the Zoom. All right, so duplicate. And Janice Kramer private or just Janice Kramer? Uh, if you do the not private, it'll be easier for you to share it with us if you need awesome. to. Otherwise, right. you'll have to move it to your gotcha. not private folder. Yeah. All righty. I think we're we're ready to roll here. Awesome. Can I ask you a quick question? I just quick lower Guerra. I'm from the drama video, y'all. Um, what's the best way to go back and forth between your personal deep note workspace and the opt-in class workspace uh if you go up to the top here you should see your name and if you click on that it should open up all the different workspaces that you have mm -hmm. and you can go in between yours and then opt in perfect thank you mm -hmm. and if you're like me you just have them both open in different tabs and and you go hunting for your tabs I think I need a second computer, one for the Zoom and one for the deep Janice, I, I am sitting in front of my tablet and my desktop. Yes. My desktop is on standby because my <laughs> tablet crashed Zoom yesterday. <laughs> and it's my new tablet. <laughs> and Janice, you can also, like if I only have a single computer, I'll often make Zoom really small because we're not going to do any instruction through Zoom. So you don't, unless you want to see our wonderful faces, you really only need access to the chat and, and being able to listen. So that way you can have your deep note much bigger. It's yeah, it's just, you know, you forget how to like make things easier. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, if, you're, if your computer gets sluggish, you can also, <laughs> we love seeing your faces, but turning off your camera also sometimes yeah. frees up that critical piece of RAM that you need. Yeah. <laughs> but these are good problems to work through because if you ever have to teach this to your students online, guess what's going to happen? Yeah. <laughs> We've had enough of that. Yeah. <laughs> is um, While people are doing this, is it reasonable to talk about the differences between CoLab and DeepNote right now as people are exploring DeepNote? Uh, I was going to do that Friday because then people will have a better idea of what we're talking about. But that's if, fine, too. If you want to fill the air. George, were you saying something? I'm sorry. I, uh, I'm just annoyed. It, it's, I've finally gotten everything settled, I think. Going back and forth between Google accounts is what I think has messed up people because my AAPT account is under my Gmail, 
uh, but Chrome tends to run under my work account and they really don't like to play together well. In fact, they don't like to play together at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, does anybody else need to share screen and, and, and have us help you walk through step by step? And please, once again, I know sometimes we're hesitant to share our screen and show that we're learning, but we learn more when you share your screen than if we repeat the same instructions with what we think we already understand. So please give all of us that learning opportunity if you are still trying to find your way into be, to deep note. Okay. Like I did not know that Kelly's browser, I think she was using Safari at first. I didn't know that caused a problem. Now I know. And now I can relay that to my students. How about the last left-hand side the sidebar doesn't show up um there's a little i don't know if you saw this on mark train but there's a little arrowhead that will show and hide it up in the top left uh, okay. and i can share my screen one more time because i haven't used sure. deep note as much as mark has and mark you'll notice has many many more workspaces than most of you will so if i share my screen you'll only see the opt-in and then my personal workspace hmm. Give me one more chance to do that here. Um, so if I go to the top left-hand portion of that where it says opt-in and I only have the opt-in workspace, which is our workshop and then my personal workspace. So that's, I can toggle between the two fairly easily there. And then you'll see it'll only open the work, the files that are in my own personal workspace. And there's that uh, arrowhead I was talking about earlier. That's the, Terry, if you want to click that, we can see what it looks like minimized. <laughs> you mean like that? Uh, no, the, the the little three line arrowhead to the right of your name. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That, I have one, that... one more question. It seems like I'm in my, my own workspace now, but how do I get back to the, the one that had everything? So Janice, do you see this? At the top left hand corner where it says show sidebar and it's just a little X or a little arrow above my picture if I click on that. Then where it says Terry Galanti, I can now go back to the opt in workspace. Right. Um, Does that help? Like I had I have this the sidebar and it has my name, but how do, how do I get back to the opt in. So do, does yours look like this, and then if you click on the down arrow. Do you it's see? Um, in the chat, Summer also has some good advice. If you're having trouble with the multiple Google accounts, um, opening an incognito browser sometimes helps that. All right. So I see like, uh, hmm. no, mine only has me. Janice, would you, would you like me to stop sharing and you could share with us and we could take a look? I can try to get to sharing. Uh, sure. And in the meantime, Mark, do you have breakout rooms ready to go? If not, this might be a good time to. I, I do. Okay. And you have the request from Twitter of the people who wanted to work together, I think. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Do you, do you Trying to mine? figure out what, what to extract from them to make that yeah. happen. <laughs> Probably if you just let people choose rooms, that's probably the easiest thing to do. So, yeah. Janice, do you see your name in the top left-hand corner with the red J? Yeah. Next? Click yeah. on that down arrow and opt-in should be an option to switch to. Oh, okay, yeah. awesome. Mm -hmm. And then I can just go back to, to mine? The, yeah, right. same thing. Mm -hmm. All right, awesome. Thanks. Uh, Bob S in chat is also having trouble. Bob, do you wanna share screen next? Right, and let me do it. Okay, what are you seeing? I, this is, well, okay, this is, can you see? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I'm trying to do is create, I thought <laughs> at least, create a new workspace with my, with my name. But you shouldn't need to, Bob, because you can use either the workshop workspace which is opt-in and you already have a personal workshape workspace below called actually yeah robert schwartz that's your personal space if you want to that's use my per okay okay was that just was that i didn't make that right it's, it's, it's one for you by default yeah. okay 
<clears throat> All right. I, I still don't. I still don't see my sidebar. I can't. There's nothing about for me to click. Okay, let me. Let me stop. Is, sorry. Would it um be easier to go in the breakout rooms now and then maybe in the smaller? I think rooms? so. Yeah, let's let's make a breakout room for for so <laughs> so if you've ever if you already signed up, we'll get you into a standard breakout room. Otherwise, we'll have one designated for if you still want uh, some help troubleshooting. And Terry, maybe uh, you and Mark can go into that one, um, mm -hmm. or maybe just one of the two of you. Um, so the way we're going to do this, there will be a facilitator in each of your breakout rooms. Their job is to answer questions, help with any technical issues along the way. They are not prepped as discussion leaders. We want you to lead that discussion. I think Terry has some instructions about that. So Terry, if you want to start that, I'll get back to sharing the presentation. Yeah, will you share the, if you want to share the presentation, Brian, yeah. and if for those of you that are following along in Google Slides, I am on slide number 11. So um, as Brian mentioned earlier throughout this morning, we just want you to wear your student hat and think of how might a high school student engage with this kind or a community college student engage with this kind of curriculum as you're working through it. Um, we do ask that you have at least that you have one group member at all times sharing their screen, because when you're having conversations and collaborating, it's helpful to all be looking at the same thing. However, we also encourage you to have your own copy that perhaps you are also manipulating on your own in parallel, right? So you can kind of do both of those things. We are going to encourage you to use something called pair programming, which clearly doesn't work if your breakout room has more than two people, but we can adapt it slightly. So pair programming is a widely used research-based computer science pedagogy, which basically ensures that each student is participating in the cognitive activity associated with your program. So if you look ahead to slide number 12, if you can take us one ahead, Brian, real quick. Um, what, what peer programming is, is essentially a driver and a navigator. And the way that the cognitive load is shared is that the driver is truly just making the edits to your notebook, either creating the code cells or editing the code cells, while the navigator, and in our case, multiple navigators, are making suggestions. And we're going to encourage you as much as possible to switch those roles every 20 minutes, because sometimes you want someone that's actually just listening and following through on ideas, but you want I, to be an idea generator as well. So once again, this is research-based, it matters because not only are students accomplishing the task for your class, but they are learning what it means to collaborate in the computer programming world, which I think is a wonderful skill for all of our 21st century learners to have. Um, it also will improve the quality of the work that you're doing together. So, um, so we again encourage you, as tempting as it is to go off on your own and rush through what you think you're excited about, please take advantage of this collaborative time to work together to build new ideas. And then going back, Brian, to slide number 11, um, our plan is to stay in the breakout rooms until 1130. So that's about 90 minutes. Please take breaks as you need. Um, as Brian already suggested, our facilitators are wonderful volunteers. All of us have expertise in different areas. So if your team and your facilitator cannot come up with an answer to a question, you'll notice that we have a virtual parking lot, and that is on slide 13 of your Google slide deck. So you can just drag and drop a sticky note and Mark, Brian and I will all be monitoring that virtual parking lot and answering questions on that Google slide if, you, if there's no one in your room that can answer the questions. And then Brian, I'll let you speak to the Slack channel if we wanna make use of that as well. Yes, so I'm also having our, our Slack channel open. Uh, we've been seeing people joining that, so I think that link that link at least is working. Um, the Slack channel is set up inside the pickup Slack space. You'll hear more about the organization pickup on Thursday when one of the leadership team comes by. Um, this is an organization that is devoted to um, helping instructors develop this computational integration. So we hope that you'll continue your conversations here in their channels uh, uh, after this workshop. We have our own private one here called UNF Opt-in. It is closed off to the general public. So it's only the folks from this workshop 
uh, are invited here. I'm going to keep that open. I get buzzes on this channel from my phone. So if you need something immediately, um, again, that your facilitator uh, is having trouble answering, you can escalate it to Terry and myself here, and one of us will be able to come by uh, uh, either answer it here or come into your breakout room. Uh, if you also have something cool, if you got a cool screenshot you want to share, post it there uh, in the Slack channel. We would love to see this populated throughout the uh, throughout the week. I suppose you also have the option of um, reply. If you want to take conversation public, you can also reply to Emma's uh, Twitter conversation that started last night, and I woke up to about thirty notifications on that. That was a lot of fun. Uh, that's that's half of a joke there, but yeah.